Sherlock Holmes in Hollywood Kryptonite. By Scott McQuaid, produced by Pop-Up Theatre. It always begins still, silent. One can be alone without being alone. It is often dark when it happens. Dying is a lonely business. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Our story begins earlier that morning. It was June 16th, 1959, and I had taken a taxi downtown to Los Angeles' little Tokyo district. I was following up on a job opportunity that I'd seen in the evening post. Since the war ended, I'd not been able to settle back into life in London. Everything had changed. So six months ago, I had decided to emigrate to America. After all, they say it is the land of opportunity. The advertisement in the paper read, wanted consulting doctor for private investigator must not be an idiot. As you could imagine, I was a little perplexed by the choice of words used in this ad. I found the address, which was stationed above a Japanese restaurant. As I reached the top stair, I was confronted with a dark, bleak, damp hallway. Water dripped from a pipe above me. I reached the office door of 221B and upon the frosted glass window pane read S. Helms, Private Investigator. You got my raw man? An elderly woman stood before me. She wore half-moon glasses with string connected to the frames. Once again, little did I know that this stranger, this secretary would be a woman I would come to call family. Her name was Mrs. Hudson. Excuse me, madam. Something tells me you're not my food delivery. Uh, no, I'm here about the job offer. Oh, right. He's interviewing another quack. Uh, I mean another doctor at the moment, so take a seat. I glanced around her very humble office. The walls were covered with framed news articles with such headlines as P.I. finds missing blanched soldier. Holmes cracks case with five orange pips. An investigator infiltrates Red Circle gang. Just as I started to relax and feel excited about the prospect of working with a private investigator, I heard a most alarming raised voice come from inside of Mr. Holmes's office. What? I've never been so offended. He's a madman. Yes, well, thank you for coming to the interview. You're a doctor? The man said to me forcefully. Um, yes. Run. Run as fast as you can away from here. Dr. Watson? Huh? Mr. Holmes will see you now. I reluctantly entered Mr. Holmes' office. The wallpaper was hanging off the ceiling, damp patches decorating the walls, complete with some rather dubious bullet holes. I looked to his desk area, but saw no one. Uh, Mr. Holmes? No, over here. Sherlock Holmes stood by a dirty window, looking down at the outside world. He smoked from a long, thin pipe and spoke without ever turning around to face me. A dead body is found at the bottom of a building. It looks quite clear that the person has committed suicide by jumping off from one of the floors. I go to the top floor of the building and enter the room facing the direction in which the body was found. I open the window and flip a coin towards the floor. I then conclude that it was murder, not suicide. How do I know this? Hmm. I assume that the body must have landed head first for you to come to this conclusion, which means somebody must have thrown the victim from the window and with the body projectile, it would have hit the floor at a right angle. Holmes turned to me with a look of astonishment. In that moment, I had impressed him. Hmm. That was a very analytical and factual-based theory. Oh, ha. thank you. Yes, I... But you're wrong. Crime is common, logic is rare. Therefore, it is upon the logic rather than upon the crime that you should dwell. Good day, Mr Watson. 
Well, uh, w w wait a minute. Uh, aren't you going to tell me why I was wrong? You're wrong because you do not concern yourself with the details. I said that I walk across the room and open the window and flip a coin towards the floor. So if it was suicide and the victim had jumped out of the window, then how come the window was closed? Oh, yes, of course. Good day. As I turned to leave, Mrs Hudson entered the room. Sherlock? Yes, send in the next doctor. Uh, there are no more. Well, in that case, you're hired, Dr Watson. I am? There's a woman out here to see you. A potential case? Very well. Send her in. In walked the most daintiest thing I had ever seen. She had long, dark, wavy hair cascading down one side of her face. Stunningly attractive, confident, intelligent, with movie-style looks and a strong perfume fragrance that followed her. She was every bit beautiful as she was mysterious. Simply put, she had a face a man might die for. Mr Holmes, I'm Irene Adler. And what can I do for you today, Miss Adler? Oh, I love the British accent. And I'm quite fond of your lavender perfume scent. However, I'm sure my origin of language is not your reasoning behind you being here today. I'm afraid not. Do you mind if I smoke? Of course. So somebody's going to die tonight. My dear, at any given time, somebody somewhere is invariably always dying. Do you know who this person is? George Reeves. George Reeves, as in Superman. George Reeves was television's first Superman to a generation of children raised on his exploits, seeing him each week leap tall buildings and outrun speeding bullets. But George had the worst kind of fame in Hollywood. He was famous, but not rich. How do you know he's going to die? Because he told me so. And would this be by his own hand or someone else's? That I'm not sure about. He just said... Tonight, I'm gonna die. Did he appear distressed when he said this? He was drunk. You see, he was celebrating. Yesterday, he got some good news. Kellogg's are going to put up money to film one more season of Superman. So he called me and asked if I would meet him for lunch to, uh, celebrate. By the time I arrived, he was already drunk. He was happy, but also sad. Why the mixed emotions? You have to understand, playing Superman was the beginning and ending of George's career. For years, he had struggled in Hollywood to be a leading man. He got a few roles in movies like Gone with the Wind and Blood and Sands, but by the time he was offered the role of Superman, <laughs> George was flat broke. So, he took the part. But he knew once you were on TV, oh, it's very difficult to get back on a movie set. And how do you know him? I met George very early on in his career. We were doing a production of Winged Victory on Broadway together. Oh, you're an actress. Stage actor, yes. I take the craft very serious. Movies are like a magic trick. You can hide, the camera chooses what the audience sees, but not on stage. So what is it you want me to do, exactly? I don't really know. I just know something's going to happen to him tonight, and I thought if... Maybe you could watch him or something, then then he'll be safe. <sighs> Sherlock was briefly lost in a trance as he slowly walked around his desk and stood in front of Irene. Where does he live? 1579 Benedict Canyon Drive, just north of Sunset Boulevard. Very well, I shall take the case. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. How much do I owe you? You may withhold my fee. After all, this is an unusual case based on keeping the subject alive, which in turn means if I fail to do so, then payment would not be required. I never looked at it that way. Yes, I'm sure. Well, <laughs> I won't take up any more of your time. I do hope that we might see each other again under different circumstances. She walked out of the room just as she entered, owning it. With a presence so strong it remained long after she had left. I could see that Sherlock was somewhat taken with this woman. <clears throat> well, uh, I suppose we find Mr Reeves? And why would we do that? 
to make sure no harm comes to him. No harm will come to him. Well, at least not during the day. How can you be so sure? Because she said somebody is going to die tonight, clearly implying whatever is going to happen to Mr Reeves will take place at nightfall. Uh, yes, yes. I must have missed that. A daily reoccurrence, I'm sure. Yes. Wait, what? See that clipboard on the cabinet over there? Yes. Bring it with you. Come, the game's afoot. As we walked along First Street's bustling district, I struggled to keep up with Holmes' erratic pace. I don't know why you don't invest in a walking stick. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the obvious injury to your leg that you try so desperately to hide. But how, how did you...? I suppose it's the soldier in you. Pride and all. But how...? And do you have money on you? Yes. Good. You're paying for the red car. What, what? 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 What's a red car? It's basically a tram, like the ones we used to have in London before they were decommissioned. I hear these are going the same way. How did you know about my wounded leg and my service in the army? My dear Watson, it is my business to know what other people do not know. You stiffen up the left side of your body and distribute your weight to the right side, therefore supporting an injury to cause less pain when you walk. However, despite your discomfort, you never once contemplated sitting down in my office. Instead, you remain standing, but not by choice, but rather by boot camp training, muscle memory to stand to attention. Only a military man would be so disciplined. Once a soldier, always a soldier. Isn't that right, James? Astounding. Except for my name, it's John. No. Well, my secretary informed me that a Dr J Watson would be attending an interview. John would have been my second choice. Still, one man's James is another man's John. What does that mean? Nothing. It's irrelevant. Much like a name. Here we are. I looked up at the sign above the large gates. It read RKO Pictures. Is this the movie studio where King Kong was made? Hmm. Citizen Kane, too. Now hold up that clipboard and follow my lead. As we walked towards the entrance of the studio, the guard stepped out in front of us. Morning, gentlemen. Can I help you? I hope so. We are the Southern California Edison Electric Company, and we are here to do a spot check on the studio's electrical relay system. Well, nobody informed me about this. And that would be correct, otherwise you would lose your job. The very definition of a spot check is investigate at random, meaning no forewarning. Yes, but... I'd expect you will follow the same protocol, otherwise you will be held in contempt of the law, and no studio wants to be filed under Section F37. Uh... What's your name? Write it down, Watson. No, 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 it's fine. You go right ahead. Uh, the back four is straight down there. I was astonished to witness with how much ease Sherlock and I had managed to gain entry into the studio lot. How do you do it? It's not me, it's the clipboard. You see, the human brain filters a lot of information, the most vital being, is this a threat or not? Or more basically... Is this something I need to be concerned about or not? A clipboard simply represents authority, something seen only by its user. This creates a certain amount of panic and anxiety within those present, so they become much more accommodating to your requests. And what about section F37? What's that? I have no idea. Holmes and I entered the vast 40-acre back lot. The studio had fallen into disarray since its heyday during the 1930s, when it was one of the leading studios of Hollywood's golden age. Holmes, why are we here? And this is the place that produced the television show, Adventures of Superman. It's where it all began, so it's only fitting our investigation starts here. What are we looking for? Who? are we looking for? And that would be somebody related to George, a friend, a co-star, somebody that can give us insight into the man. What about her? 
I was pointing to the actress Phyllis Coates, who was best known for her role as the plucky reporter Lewis Lane, playing alongside George Reeves in Superman. She had starred in a few motion pictures, but most B-list material, with titles such as Panther Girl of the Congo and I Was a Teenage Frankenstein. Miss Coates? Yes? I'm Dr Watson, and this is Sherlock Holmes a private investigator. Uh, we wondered if we could ask a few questions about George Reeves. A PI? Is George all right? Mm, for the moment, yes. But we believe there might be an attempt on his life tonight. Oh, my God. By who? Well, we're rather hoping you might be able to help us on that question. Does he have any known enemies? No, not really. Although... Yes? Go on. It's probably nothing, but for the past few months, George and Tony have been fighting a lot since George broke off their relationship. Tony who? Tony Mannix, the actress. Well, she used to act. Way back when pictures had just started to have sound, when they were known as the talkies. <laughs> yes, I remember. Uh, and they said it wouldn't work. Anyway, you were saying about George and Tony's relationship. Yes, well, Tony was infatuated with George. To be honest, without her, George may not have got ahead in Hollywood. She was his refuge, his financial salvation, his soulmate, his keeper. Why did she and George break up? I don't know, but Tony has a reputation in Hollywood circles for her extramarital relationships. Who was she married to? Eddie Mannix. Then surely that's why George broke off the affair. Oh, it wasn't an affair. Well, at least not in the sense of the word. There was this mutual understanding between the four of them. Or so she said. Four of them? Oh, Eddie has a girlfriend too, but nobody knows who she is. She's from out of town. It was very bizarre. They would all go together on double dates. They were friends. But then George broke up with Tony and he started seeing Lenore. Who's Leonore? Lenore Lemon. George's fiance. That's when the trouble started. Tony was harassing George and Lenore on a daily basis. In the end, George had to file for a restraining order against her. I see. And what about your relationship with George? Oh, we're just good friends. George was always very charming and playful on set, although he did drink too much. But in front of the public, he was the perfect role model. Kids loved him. I mean, they actually believed he was the real Superman. There's even one occasion where a young boy pointed a loaded gun at him. He wanted to test Superman's invincibility. George was very calm and confident. He managed to convince the boy to put the gun down by telling him someone else would get hurt when the bullet bounced off him. Brave man. Yes, he is. But he struggles with the character. He used to burn his Superman outfit at the end of every season. I remember my first day of shooting, he leaned over to me and said, Welcome to the bottom of the barrel. He was right. I haven't had a decent role since I took that job. But you'll be returning to the role as Lewis Lane. I'm sorry. I, I don't understand. Haven't you heard the news? George is going to be Superman again. Although Miss Coates had quit after the first season of Superman, one could tell that she was upset with not being considered or informed about a new season. Our next stop took us downtown to the office of another private investigator. Sherlock, can't you knock? Of course I can knock. I just refuse to do so. Dr. Watson, allow me to introduce you to Lestrade. Afternoon, sir. So you're a P.I. as well? Let's just say Lestrade is in a constant cycle of training with no end in sight. Is there something I can do for you, Sherlock? Or is this visit merely to belittle me? Why can't it be both? Tell me, what do you know about Eddie Mannix? Eddie Mannix? Oh, his bad news. He's a fixer for MGM Studio. A what? An enforcer. Somebody that fixes problems outside the law. Do try to keep up, Watson. He, well, he's listed as the studio's general manager, but he's actually a gangster. His job is to ensure that the scandalous actions of MGM's biggest stars are kept a secret, hidden from public and press. So what's this case you're working on? It's a murder case. Who died? Nobody. So, you're investigating a murder that hasn't happened? Precisely. <laughs> okay, well, good luck with that. Now, if you don't mind, I have my own puzzle to solve with an actual murder. Really? Do tell. Okay. So, the crime scene shows our victim hanging from a noose on the 12th floor. Now, the problem is the rafter he's hanging from is nine feet tall. Now, was the killer able to tie the noose over the rafter to hang his victim? 
There's nothing in the room, just a leaky pipe. What makes you say that? Well, there was a puddle of water below him. Ice. Yes, that's why there's a pool of water below the body. Of course, there's an ice factory opposite. <laughs> Thanks, Sherlock. I'll be sure to mention your name in my press statements. No, thank you. I should prefer that you do not mention my name at all in connection with this case, as I choose to be only associated with those crimes which present some difficulty in their solution. Good day, Lestrade. And with that blatant rude departure, Holmes and I left. I was soon learning that Sherlock Holmes was indeed not a nice person to be around, but there was something magnetic about his personality. One knew that despite his flaws in basic human decency, he were in fact in the company of a genius. Time ticked away as our window to find a potential killer was slowly closing. Our next stop took us to the factory offices of the Kellogg's Company, the maker of cornflakes and other breakfast cereals. Come in, come in, please, sit down. Arnold G. Langbo held many positions over the years at the Kellogg's Company, but since 1951, when the founder John Harvey Kellogg died, he found himself as the chairman of the Kellogg's Empire. So, my secretary tells me your private eyes. That's a new one for me. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Mr. Langbo, I understand that Kellogg's is going to sponsor another season of The Adventures of Superman. Is that correct? Whoa, news does travel fast. We haven't even released that to the press yet. But yeah, we are. In fact, we were looking into all sorts of new projects. It's good branding for our cereals. Such as? Uh, college sponsors, sports, theater, radio. Theater? Yeah, we was going to sponsor a Broadway show. What's the show? Uh, I think I have a flyer. Here. A scandal in Bohemia. <laughs> Sounds rather dramatic. So, you're not sponsoring this show anymore. Why the change of heart? Money. Like all things in this world, it comes down to money. We have a marketing budget, and it was either sponsor a Broadway show or do another season of Superman. To be honest, I wasn't sure George would return to the role. I had heard he was being considered for a part in a Hitchcock movie. Holmes, do you know who's the lead in this play? Let me take a guess. Irene Adler. Time ticked away as our window to find George's potential killer was slowly closing. Night had fallen over Tinseltown, and I found myself in West Hollywood at Cyro's nightclub on the Sunset Strip. It had a Brock style, known for its red ceiling and red silk sofas, with celebrities dripping from every table. Its entertainment often included class acts such as Rat Packers, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. As we walked down the hazy, bustling club, Sherlock suddenly stopped and picked up a small bottle of pills from the floor. Watson, you claim to be a doctor. What are these for? Claim to be? Oh, dear, let me see. Oh, uh, they're opioids. It's a pill designed to keep you up, energised. It actually contains heroin. Uh, I wonder who they belong to. Sherlock glanced around the venue for a moment and then approached a blonde-haired woman. Excuse me, madam, you dropped these. Oh, how silly of me. They must have just slipped out. Thank you. <laughs> Holmes, <laughs> do you know who that was? No. That was Marilyn Monroe. Was it? Uh. Well, how did you know it was her pills? I just looked for somebody with their pupils dilated and a slight shake in their hand. Miss Monroe's symptoms seemed to fit. Now, where are they? Just then, an eruption of <laughs> laughter came from the back of the room in a dimly lit corner. We approached the table, and there sat a very drunk George Reeves, nestled between Tony Mannix, his ex-lover, and his current fiancée, Leonor Lemon, a reputed headline-hungry gold digger. Mr. Reeves. Oh, hey, what can I do for you? You want an autograph? Not especially, no. <laughs> are you British? Yes, we are, madam. <laughs> now I'm interested. Leonor gave Tony a noticeable stink eye and then said, Do you mind? We're trying to celebrate. Mr. Reeves, I heard you are dying tonight. Hmm, that sounds mysterious. What's going to happen to George? He's going to be murdered approximately three hours from now. Ha, <laughs> murdered? Have you heard? 
I'm Superman. Nothing can hurt me. Just then, I felt an intimidating presence appear behind me. Is there a problem here? It was Tony's husband, Eddie Mannix. Eddie was a stocky man with a round face and a gruff demeanor. There's no problem here, darling. It's just two charming, concerned citizens. That's all. I think it's time for you gentlemen to leave. Sherlock paid little attention to the threat, as something had caught his attention. He turned his nose up and sniffed the air in the direction of Eddie Mannix. I said, I think it's time for you gentlemen to leave. There's no need to repeat yourself. I ignored you just fine the first time. Oh, hey, hey. I didn't give you my autograph. George pulled out a book of matchsticks from his pocket. Here. Now you two have a good night. Sherlock took the book of matches from George as two of Eddie's goons escorted us through the back of the club and into a dark alley. Well, <laughs> that could have gone better. On the contrary, I got exactly what I needed. And what's that? Confirmation that George fears for his life. Sherlock held up the small book of matchsticks that George had signed. Only he hadn't signed his name at all. Instead, he wrote one word in his shaky, drunken handwriting. Lie. Los Angeles Police Department. Detective William Parker. Hold, please. This is Detective Parker. Who am I speaking to? Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock brought Detective Parker up to speed on his investigation and suggested that he station a police car outside George Reeves' residence. However, the detective explained that the entire Benedict Canyon area is a private property and without any real evidence of a suspected crime, he could not order any squad car to park outside the house. George Reeves lay naked on the bed in a pool of blood, with a gun between his feet, a shell casing beneath his corpse, a bullet in his brain, and a thick spray of his blood stretching up the wall to the slanted ceiling. The Man of Steel was dead. Holmes and I entered the crime scene and saw Leonore Lemon front and centre, giving her accounts of the evening's events. She was accompanied by her house guest, the writer Robert Condon, and two neighbours. All of them were stupefied with alcohol. Miss Lemon claims that she and Reeves returned to the house from dinner at around 11pm. Reeves then went to bed alone around midnight, but came down in an irritable mood an hour later complaining to his guests. Reeves eventually apologised for his bad mood and returned upstairs to his bedroom. Then Lemon said, He's going to shoot himself. Whereupon, through the thin ceiling, they heard a bedside drawer open. He's getting the gun out now, and he's going to shoot himself. And, sure enough... A shot rang out into the still dead of night. This incident is said to have taken place between 1.30am and 2am. At least, this is how the four very drunk witnesses said it went down in perfunctory police interviews conducted that evening, before they scattered into the night. We proceeded upstairs into the bedroom where the body of Superman lay. Well, from what I can see, it looks like an open-shut case of suicide. And you would be profusely wrong. Uh, who are you? Private Investigator Sherlock Holmes. We spoke this evening when you declined my request to station police outside Mr. Reeves' home. Tell me, should I point out the obvious here? Okay, Mr. P.I., why don't you tell me what you see? Everything. It is my curse. Let's start with the position of our victim's body on the bed, shall we? The gunshot is on the right side of the temple, yet the bullet is lodged directly in the ceiling above him, which means if he's sitting on the bed and raises the gun to the right side of his temple and shoots, then the bullet is going to pass through his head and end up somewhere in the wall on his left side. It most certainly will not result in its final destination. That being the ceiling. No, for this to occur, the head would have to be positioned horizontal at the time of the gun firing. Hmm. Yes, I agree. And who are you? This is Dr. Watson. He is my personal forensic pathologist. 
Now let us examine the rather careless position of the gun. Positioned between our victim's feet, it is certainly not impossible, but very questionable. If, in fact, we are to believe that George sat on the bed and shot himself in the side of the head, then his body would recoil, jerking back to his left, which means his pistol hand would likely fall down to his side, therefore dropping the gun onto the right side of the bed. Yes, that does seem the more logical scenario. And I suppose you find the shell casings being under the body suspicious too? No, not at all. Really? Uh, then how do you explain it? Most automatic revolvers eject their spent cartridges from the side of the weapon, but the gun used here is a 9mm Luger. This type of gun ejects its shell from the top and projects directly up and forward, meaning that it could have easily flown up into the air and fallen behind George as the body slumped backwards. Ah, yes. Clever deduction. It's elementary, my dear Watson. OK, for the sake of argument, let's say this is a homicide. How did the killer enter and exit the room without all the guests downstairs seeing? I suspect the killer exited by the guest bedroom that has two windows on the slanted roof facing the driveway, making it a relatively easy escape route. Now, as for the killer's entrance, I think they entered through the front door, hid upstairs, and played the waiting game. Then, when George and company returned home, the killer came out from hiding. George was asleep with his head hanging off the bedside, which allowed the killer to place the gun underneath his head and shoot. This would then concur with the bullet in the ceiling. And the killer done all this with all those people downstairs completely unaware. Who says they were unaware? Are you saying that they are accessories to George's murder? Yeah, I'm saying it's worth contemplating that one or perhaps all of them may be somehow involved. That's a wild theory, Mr. Holmes. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to the precinct. To further add to Holmes's conspiracies, Leonore Lemon would return later to the crime scene. She broke the police tape seal across the front door and entered the house. She would leave moments later with over $4,000 in traveller's checks. She claims George had bought them for their honeymoon. She then absconded to New York, never to return, and she never did. By the time Holmes and I arrived back at the office, it had just gone 5 a.m. No sooner had Sherlock slumped into his chair when... Sherlock Holmes Investigations. Mr. Holmes, it's Phyllis. Sherlock leaned forward in his chair. I heard about George's death. From the morning edition, I assume. No, I received a phone call from Tony Mannix early this morning. And what time was this? Around 4.30, she was beside herself. She said, Phyllis, the boy is dead. He's been murdered. She was hyperventilating and ranting. I spent most of the conversation trying to calm her down. Anyway, I thought you should know. Thank you, Miss Coates. Well, what did she tell you? Everything, the two women in George's life being Tony Mannix and Leonore Lemon. Both used him but loved him unconditionally, which rules them out as the actual killer. However, this does not disregard them as accessories to his murder, either prior or post George's demise. Eddie Mannix is the man to do it. Correction, Watson. Eddie Mannix is the man to hire a professional to do it. But the question is why? Killing George would only create drama between him and Tony, so he must have had another reason. Sherlock laid back into his chair and picked up his pipe. I could almost hear the wheels and cogs turning inside his brain. He flipped open a book of matches. But then he stopped, frozen, as the flame burned slowly down the match towards his fingers. He was looking at the word lie that George had written on the inside of the matchbook. He blew out the flame. <gasps> He then rotated the matchbook upside down. The messy, shaky written word lie became something else entirely. It wasn't a word at all. It was a number. Three, one, seven. What is it? A room number. Holmes flipped the matchbook over, revealing the front cover of a logo that read Roosevelt Hotel. 
As we stood in the hallway of the Roosevelt Hotel outside the door 317, a wave of anxiety came over me. I was both excited and nervous to see who was on the other side of the door. Holmes, I don't like this. Perhaps we should contact Detective Parker. Why would we do such a thing? We don't know what's on the other side of that door. They could be dangerous. It, it could be our killer. Rest assured, it is not the killer. It is, in fact, a person of small stature with a dainty frame weighing no more than a hundred pounds, drenched in lavender perfume. Please come in. Would you gentlemen like some coffee? I can call reception. You don't seem surprised to see us. You're a P.I. It's your job to find people. A suitcase was on the bed. She was in the middle of packing. Checking out, Miss Adler. I'm afraid so. I have to get back to New York. Of course. You have a new show to work on. That's right. It's a play about manipulation. It's very clever. Yes, I'm sure. Sponsored by Kellogg's, no doubt. I don't know about the details. That's the producer's job. I'm just an actress. On and off stage, I would say. A woman in today's world has to use everything she's got to level the playing field. Is that what you did with Eddie Mannix? I'm afraid I really have to pack, otherwise I'll miss my flight. You were seeing Eddie Mannix, and furthermore you convinced him to have George killed. Irene stopped her packing and sat on the side of the bed in a nonchalant fashion. She lit a cigarette. Go on. The Kellogg's Company could only sponsor one big production, and between your Broadway show and TV's Adventures of Superman, they chose the latter. This not only put you out of work, but it took away your first leading role in a show. So to get Kellogg's to change their mind, you would have to do something drastic. After all, they can't make Superman without Superman. So you started to date Eddie Mannix, a mystery girl from out of town that nobody knew. This was first brought to my attention when I spoke to Phyllis Coates. She said... Oh, Eddie, oh, Eddie has a girlfriend, has a girlfriend too, too, but, but nobody, nobody knows, knows who, who she, she is. is. She's from, She's out, from of out of town. Confirmation of your relationship with Mr. Mannix came when I met him at the Cyro's nightclub last night. I must have missed you as your lavender fragrance still lingered upon Eddie's person. Your manipulation over Eddie Mannix would have been easy. After all, his wife had been having a relationship with George, and with your, let's say, persuasive skill set, I'm sure Eddie was very acquiescent. And with George's fiancée, Leonore, known for her temper tantrums, and his affair with Tony Mannix, that would make them promising suspects for the police, while keeping the trail away from you. George knew Eddie was looking to fix him, and he had a suspicion who might be behind it. That's why he gave me this. Sherlock held up the hotel matchbook, displaying Irene's room number. George had obviously been here, and whatever you did or told him set alarm bells ringing, but he had no one to turn to, nobody to trust, as all the women in his life were potentially out to get him. That's very impressive. You're right, on all accounts. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really must go. She shut her suitcase, grabbed her purse, and headed towards the door. I really do hope we meet again, Sherlock. Are you going to just let her walk away? Yes. Why? No evidence, my dear Watson. It's all circumstantial. Miss Adler is a very calculated creature. But why would she risk telling us in the first place that George Reeves was going to die? Surely that brings unwanted attention to her. Exactly. She likes to play games, and I must say, she played it well. Ha 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 